Thanks so much, Raquel. Our text for uh, today comes from Mark's Gospel, chapter 11. As the sermon title (laughs) suggests, it's the story of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It's also the passage from which our celebration of Palm Sunday is so conveniently taken. As many of you know, Palm Sunday marks the beginning of Holy Week. Raquel just mentioned that. Often in the church, not just ours, but but globally, we recognize Christ's entry into Jerusalem the Sunday before Easter. We observe Christ's crucifixion on Good Friday and his resurrection from the grave on Easter Sunday. This shouldn't surprise you. That's, That's our plan. But outside of the week to come, we're going to continue our chapter-by-chapter study of Mark's gospel. And even though we're looking at the triumphal entry today, our study of Mark won't conclude until near the end of June. There's a lot that happens in between in this important week, which just shows us how much of the gospel focuses on the very last week of Jesus' earthly life. It will take us not a week to cover, but several months. Before we look at Jesus' entry, I want to remind you of something we talked about several weeks ago to set this up. Mark chapter 8, we read the the peculiar story of Jesus' two-part healing of a blind man. Jesus followed this miracle by posing a question to the disciples outside of Caesarea Philippi, who do you say that I am? To which Peter answered, you are the Messiah. We also observe Jesus' curious response. He warned them not to tell anyone about him. I mentioned it's the same wording Jesus used in rebuking the demons earlier in Mark, for they knew who he was. Jesus confirmed his identity, but it was to be kept under wraps. Over the course of the next three chapters, Jesus predicts his death three times. In 8.31, in Mark chapter 9, verse 30 and 31, and then in chapter 10, verses 33 and 34. There, as we saw last week, Jesus states as, about as clearly as possible, we're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise." Two things are going on in this section. Jesus and his disciples are on a physical journey. They're on their way up to Jerusalem for the Passover. The Passover, if you're you're newer to this, is the celebration of God's liberation of the Israelites from slavery to Pharaoh. Every year, every able Jew was to gather in Jerusalem to celebrate what God has done. That's what Jesus and his disciples were doing. At the same time, like the healing of the blind man in chapter 8, Jesus is helping the disciples to see that he is the Messiah. Contrary to the hopes and expectations of, of almost everyone, he's not the Messiah they're looking for. He's come to suffer. He makes clear his death would be no accident, nor even some great tragedy, it was anticipated. And according to Jesus, it was necessary. Last week, we looked at the healing of another blind man by the name of Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus was begging along the side of the road outside of Jericho. When he heard Jesus of Nazareth was passing by, he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Why son of David? Why not Joseph or Mary? The son of David is a messianic title. It's a way of speaking about the king who was to come, and not just any king. 
The son of David was to, to free them from oppression and bring about an eternal universal rule over all the nations. The top of his lungs for anyone with ears to hear, Bartimaeus was calling Jesus the Messiah. When Peter called Jesus the Messiah, he was sternly warned. When this man does so, many rebuked him. There is the word again. They told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. We've got two miraculous healings of blindness, along with two declarations of Jesus' identity that frame this section. But there's a difference in the declarations, or at least in the response. When Peter says, Jesus, you're the Messiah, Jesus says, hush. The second declaration by Bartimaeus, it's those nearby who do so. Jesus doesn't intervene. He doesn't say, whoa, you got the wrong guy. Instead, in essence, Jesus says, yeah, what can I help you with? What had been privately disclosed is now being freely proclaimed. The king is going public. We've begun a new section where Jesus not only allows his messiahship to be discussed openly by his actions, Jesus is driving the conversation. Even the miracle was, was public. When Jesus healed the blind man in Bethsaida, he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. He took him away from the crowd and the onlookers. Afterward, Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. It's private. In the second healing of Bartimaeus, Mark tells us Jesus and his disciples, together with the large crowd, were leaving the city. Now, without hesitation, Jesus performed the miracle before the crowd. Now, the crowd is important for several reasons. First of all is their destination. Sure, they wanted to see Jesus, but they weren't just gathered there for that. They were like Jesus and his disciples on the way up to Jerusalem. And they've become witnesses. The actions in, in chapter 11 become more, uh, even more clear in light of what they've seen. And saying, son of David, Bartimaeus was yelling, you're the Messiah, have mercy on me. And Jesus does exactly as the Messiah was expected to do. His miracle fulfilled the words of the prophet Isaiah, then, the, then will the eyes of the blind be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped. And a large crowd saw Jesus doing this and they continued on to Jerusalem. No doubt talking about what they'd seen on the way. And once they arrived, the air would have been electric. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say the Lord needs it and we'll send it back here shortly. Now, there's some debate about this passage, particularly regarding Jesus' knowledge of the cult. Like, how did he know it would be there? Was this an example of divine omniscience? Like Jesus shows in John's gospel when he saw Nathaniel under the fig tree before Philip called him. And what about Matthew's gospel when Jesus instructs Peter to cast his line, catch a fish in which he would find a coin to pay the temple tax? If, if it was that, it's, it's not without precedent. On the other hand, without denigrating Jesus' divinity, it's not implausible that this had been prearranged. John provides us a detail that isn't present in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. From Jericho, Jesus traveled to Bethany. 
for dinner with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. It's in this visit where Mary anoints Jesus' feet and Judas is aghast. It's possible that Jesus' knowledge of the area and his visit in Bethany gave him an opportunity to, to set this up. Whatever option you lean toward, one thing is undeniable. Jesus was intentionally planning and coordinating these actions. Jesus orchestrated his his entry. You might even say that the crowd's response was anticipated. In other words, you don't catch Jesus going, Oh, shucks, you guys shouldn't have. In Luke, he answers the critics regarding the praises heaped upon him. He says, if they didn't, the rocks would. Do you catch how different that is from what preceded? Mark's retelling of the entry is the shortest, yet even Mark gives substantial space to what might seem on the face of it minor details. I promise you, though, these details are not minor. The more I, I've thought about it, the more these, these seemingly obscure details make sense. Take verse 3, for instance, where Jesus gives the disciples the practical advice. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. Now imagine you walk outside your home or your apartment in the morning. You see someone climbing into your car and you ask, hey, what are you, what are you doing? To which they respond, it's okay. The Lord needs it. Maybe they quote the Blues, uh, the blues Brothers. We're on a mission from God. We're probably not going to respond well. But that's not what's happening Jesus and his disciples would have been rather recognizable. It's the very recognition of the disciples that following Jesus' arrest led to Peter's thrice denial that he knew Jesus. Lied through his teeth. You got the wrong guy. Bethany was the town in which Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. A miracle so significant, so widely known that John tells us the chief of priests were planning to kill Lazarus as well. In fact, just the verse before John relates, large crowds were coming out from Jerusalem to see Jesus and Lazarus who he'd raised. Many in the region had come to see Jesus and believe in Jesus. It's not surprising that in a place like this, when a disciple states, the Lord needs it, the response is essentially, the Lord can take whatever he needs. But why does the Lord need it? From the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem, you go down a steep path into a valley and then a short ascent into the city. It's a journey of less than a mile The walk he made the day before from Jericho to Bethany is about 17 miles uphill. Why ride now? Other than taking a boat across the lake a handful of times, this is the only instance in which Jesus is recorded riding anything in the Gospels. What's more peculiar, this last leg was often the point in the Passover pilgrimage where those who rode all the way would dismount so that they could make that final ascent by foot. And the question isn't just why does Jesus insist to ride at this point, but also why this ride? Why a donkey? As we Uh, As James read in in the opening worship set, it comes from Zechariah 9.9. Matthew's gospel tells us as much. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey. And on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Who else in history has done anything at the same time so bold and yet so humble. 
He's been biding his time, proclaiming the kingdom, but now in his action, he states, I am the king. I'm the one you've been waiting for. It's bold. And yet look at his ride, it's humble. Jesus entered in through the east gate. Not just on a donkey, but the full of a donkey. That same week, there was a Roman imperial procession entering through the west gate from Caesarea Maritima, referring to the Roman governor, Pilate. Pilate would have entered in on a massive white war horse, flanked by 600 infantry in full armor carrying sword and spear along with a unit of mounted cavalry. It was, uh, excuse me, cavalry. It was a picture intentionally designed by Rome to flex their muscle, lest Passover stir any revolutionary aspirations. That's an entry. Jesus rides in on a little donkey. No swords or standards, just some ragtag disciples and pilgrims singing songs about deliverance. There are two other details I want to point out. Jesus arranges for much more than a donkey. He arranges one that's never been ridden. Now, why is that detail important? After all, Zechariah doesn't say anything about that. It's not like the people that are watching are going to know the difference, right? Is this like Van Halen when they insisted no brown M&Ms in their dressing room? Is Jesus going full diva? Like, I'm not riding a donkey that anyone, anyone else has ridden. That's gross. No. The Old Testament speaks of, of things being set aside for sacred use. Numbers 19.2, Deuteronomy 21.3, 1 Samuel 6.7. These are passages that speak about things being set apart. We also see it in Jesus' own life. He was born of a woman who had never been with a man. And at the end of his life, buried in a tomb that had never been used. There's a set-apartness to Jesus' life. Our spotless lamb is not only sinless, but set apart, sacred and holy. It's not a big point, but it points to his atoning work on the cross for us. There's another prophetic connection that goes even further back to Genesis 49. On Jacob's deathbed with his sons gathered around, the grandson of Abraham prophesied of things to come. To his son Judah, he said, Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion and as a lioness who dares rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him. To him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his foal to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He was washed in garments in wine. He washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. At the time, Jacob's family was 70 in all. Before God's people was a people, before they possessed the land of promise, much less dreamed of a king, there was a promise of one from Judah's own family who would rule all the nations. And we would know him because he came on a donkey's colt. In case you need any encouragement in this, our God is a promise-keeping God. God is faithful and the plan is good. Often we need to be patient. Right? Zechariah's prophecy was 400 years in coming. Genesis 49, so much more. Often we need to be patient, but God is faithful. I'm not suggesting that that the people picked up on all of these. Not all of them. 
But I am suggesting that Jesus orchestrated the triumphal entry in fulfillment of God's word. What I am saying is that God is faithful to fulfill all his promises concerning Jesus. Whether or not the people got it has no bearing on whether God is going to do what God says. Mark continues, they went and found a colt outside in the street tied at a doorway As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying the colt? They answered just as Jesus told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Now, how many of you would would lay your coat out in the street? Let's go out to Colorado. We'll all just put our, our coats down. Let somebody walk over it, ride a donkey over it. Like they didn't have a washer or dryer. Most of them didn't have a backup cloak. The road would have been dusty. And with all the animals on the road, dust is best case scenario. And yet Jesus comes riding and the people laid their cloaks on the ground. This is more than rolling out the red carpet. What they're doing says something powerful about their belief in the one they're doing it for. In 2 Kings, after Elisha anointed Jehu, the people with him quickly took their cloaks and they spread them under him on the bare steps. They blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. Mark doesn't tell us why the people waved, or excuse me, that the people waved palm branches. He just said the people spread branches. It's John, John's gospel, that that tells us they were palm branches. That only means something to us because we've come to call this day Palm Sunday. But why palms? Because 200 years before Judas Maccabeus, also known as Judas the Hammer, defeated the Syrian king, then rode into Jerusalem, a conquering hero, and the people waved palms. Jehu and Judas. What did they have in common? They were military leaders. They were conquering heroes. What do you think the people were hoping for? And Passover was essentially their Independence Day. They're subject to Roman oppression. Here comes a teacher and miracle worker. And he's not denying this. He's embracing it. What do you think they hoped for? Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. If you've got your Bible open, you might have a footnote here. Their words, at least in part, come from Psalm 118. Now, there are different psalms that are sung at different points of of the year and, and for different purposes. This psalm, Psalm 118, was traditionally sung on the way up to Jerusalem for a festival like Passover. Here on this occasion, as they're doing what they've probably done year after year, its meaning became true in an unthinkable way. Hosanna is really a prayer. It means, Lord, save us. And as, as they sang and laid cloaks and waved palms, a king whose name means the Lord saves made his way toward Jerusalem. Following Hosanna, they continue, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and clothes with Hosanna in the highest heavens. But there's something important that they've added. Something that's not in the psalm. They've inserted the first half of verse 10. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. If you didn't get it with the cloaks or the palms, it's here in their song. They realize and vocalize Jesus is is he's the long-awaited king he's arrived the kingdom is here and luke includes the detail some of the pharisees in the crowd said to him teacher rebuke your disciples 
Jesus, tell them, tell them to stop. See, they realize this is dangerous. Claiming that Jesus is the king and he's bringing in a new kingdom is dangerous. The very reason that Pilate showed up decked out in strength was just in case someone came claiming to be king, instigating revolution. The Pharisees hated the Romans, but even they recognized to instigate a revolution against Rome was crazy. Right? I mean, they'll crucify you for that. They will do exactly what Jesus said they would do. He could have avoided it. Instead, he orchestrated it. People, Jesus is crazy. Or he really is who he said he was. His ministry lasted three years. When he went public as king, he lasted a week. That explains the secrecy part. The only thing that could unite the priests and the Pharisees, Herod and Pilate, was Jesus. Jesus orchestrates his entry in fulfillment of of the word so that he could provoke the worldly powers. Because Jesus didn't come to rule from the throne in Jerusalem. He came to give his life as a ransom on the cross outside its city walls. For all but Jesus, this is a coronation parade. For Jesus, it was a funeral procession. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. It's an odd ending to the text. It's almost an anticlimax. The clamoring crowd seemed to have disappeared, and, and Mark doesn't tell us why. He leaves us in suspense. And we do know that in light of what unfolds in days to come, that the crowd experiences much the same things the, thing the disciples experienced in Caesarea Philippi. Jesus was not the king they were looking for. Jesus did not come as a king like Jehu or a deliverer like Judas the Hammer. He would not restore them to the military greatness of David putting his foot on the throats of their enemies. His plan was something different entirely. The truth is many of us are not that different than the crowd. (laughs) We'll throw Jesus a parade We'll hang around him for a while, sing a song or two, so long as he makes our lives better. He can be king if he keeps us happy and successful. If he takes care of our enemies, supports our political party, if he likes the things we like and hates the things we hate. In other words, we like, Jesus, we like a Jesus who looks and sounds a lot like us. And we'll see in the the week to come that there are lots of people who were happy for Jesus to be their Messiah so long as they got to sit on the throne. But Jesus cannot, he will not be the king of our lives if we're still setting the terms of his kingdom. He's not crazy. He's the king. He's not just a, a helpful counselor. He's the Lord. Yes, he came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. But that doesn't mean we call the shots. He does. And our response is surrender and obedience. Yes, he came to disarm principalities and powers. Defeat the prince of darkness. He defanged death. But his deliverance is also of ourselves from ourselves. From our very desires for our own kingdom. He came to rescue us from ourselves. And and when following Jesus means that, it's no surprise that the parade disappears. I think the final lesson from the disappearing parade is that Jesus doesn't want our enthusiasm 
He wants our lives. The fact is he's traded his own life for them. Shall we praise him? Absolutely. It is fitting and appropriate. All creation praises him. Should we? Yes. Should we be excited about who he is and what he's done? I I should think so. But cloaks and palms are not what he's asked for. He told us back in Mark chapter 8, when he first told us who he is and why he's come, the way we follow him is not cutting down palm branches or even laying down cloaks but taking up our cross. The right response to the king is worship. Don't mishear me. But let's be worshipers as Paul describes in Romans. Therefore, I urge you brothers and sisters in the view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. May we be excited and enthusiastic. May we delight in the one who created us. And may the sacrificial offerings of our lives be pleasing to him. Church, let's pray together. Gracious God, we, we praise you. We praise you for, for the gift of your son. We praise you for the king who has come. We praise you that, that even today you are working out your kingdom in this place and we long for the day when your kingdom will come fully and finally. Lord, we pray that you would Uh, that you would empower us to align our lives with your kingdom today. That we might follow Jesus, whether the parade joins us or not, we may follow Jesus wherever he goes. And tell others about him, whoever it be, for his glory, amen.